verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will go out, come in, and go out and find pasture. I want to do something. I want to back up a little. We're going to look at, we're going to add in from verse 7, and then we're going to come into verse 9, and we're going to go to verse 10. He says, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I want to zoom all the way out and and I want you guys to help me out. When we get to verse 9, I want you to read along with me out loud. We have parents here, so use your mom voice if you have to. Use your dad voice. Amen. You ready? I'm going to go from verse 1, and when we get to verse 9, I want you guys to join in with me. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow because they know his voice but they'll never follow a stranger in fact they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice Jesus used this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them verse 7 therefore Jesus said again very truly I tell you I am the gate for the sheep get ready guys verse 8 all who have come before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep have not listened to them you ready on three. One, two, three. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Can you guys bow your head in prayer with me? Father God, I thank you for everybody in this house. I thank you that we have a people who have showed up and want something from you, Lord. I pray that a shift may take place today, that this is not a good message, that this is not, oh, Reuben, he talks good, but no, 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 this is, oh, hey, God shifted something today. I remember on June 25th, we were in the I Am series, and, and a shift took place, Father God. I pray that you use me in your name, Lord. And if I could just make a special prayer, God, my, my, my brother Rolando is, is getting slimmer, Lord. And I ask that you just, as he gets skinnier, Lord, you just protect my clothing from him, Lord. You, you keep my clothes from, from the hand of Rolando Remedios, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Woo! As he gets skinnier, I feel less and less like the good-looking brother I thought I was. He said second best good-looking. I was like, I agree. <laughs> Amen. How many of you guys are thankful for our pastors? We got some dedicated, like dedicated pastors. Like I've been at Rolando's house way past his bedtime just because I got my own issues and he opens the door, and, and, and I know he's been there for each and every one of us. I know we can think of time that Lisa has been there for us. And I, I'm thankful that we don't have just some pastors who come to do church, but they, they come to do life and, and, and what God has called them. And so if you guys could just help me join your hands together for Pastor Rolando and Lisa. You guys are the best couple I know <clears throat> for now until I'm a couple. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> I have three older brothers, and my third brother, Rodolfo, was actually supposed to be the last brother. Like, I came out seven years later. Surprise, Ma. You know? I, I, wasn't, I wasn't expected. So, so there was this huge age gap. As a matter of fact, I was the baby of the family for a while until Raul reached the age where he could reproduce and five kids came out. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I was the baby of the family for a while. My mother and father divorced at a very young age. And so when you combine all that, what you get is uh, I grew up a mama's boy. You guys could tell, right? Like I have the face of a mama's boy. 
Uh, but I grew up a mama's boy, super attached to my mother. Like, uh, despite her best efforts, I wouldn't stop sleeping in the same bed as her uh, until middle school. And she would try to kick me out, but I was too determined. Uh, I would go everywhere with her. I would go country dancing with my mother in middle school, which when you go country dancing with your mother in middle school is why you have no friends in middle school. Uh, but it was bad. Like, I was super attached to her, and it was worse when I was a kid, because when I was a kid, uh, I, I would, like, she, she always had this saying, actually, throughout growing up, but she used to say, Reuben, cut the umbilical cord. I didn't know what that meant until high school, but I was super attached to her, and as a kid, she would have to sneak out to go to work. I call her double O mom. Like, she had to be on her super stuff, full Metal Gear Solid box and everything to go to work, because if I woke up, she wasn't leaving. And, and if she managed to sneak out, once she managed to sneak out, I... I would run around the house, look for her. My three brothers would sometimes be there and they had no heart. They'd be like, yo, mom's gone. And so I would just cry and bawl my eyes out. I'd run to her room and I'd wrap myself into her blanket. And she had this cream that she used to use, so it had this scent and I would just sniff it. <gasps> Mommy, I'm your son. And I hyperventilated when I cried, which hyperventilating is like when you suck on your lip while you cry. <laughs> Do we have any hyperventilators? Am I alone? Hyper <laughs> Mommy. It was bad. Super attached to her. But fast forward, right? Like, as you can see, I'm a man now. I got a job. I'm a college man. I pay some of my bills. I'm not a mama's boy. I'm a mama's man. That's different. Like, it manifests itself differently. Like, I, I do miss her when I come home, and she's retired now, so she goes out dancing to all her uh, golden girl pals. Um, and, and so sometimes she's not home. But, like, she went to Costa Rica for a month, and I was chilling. I was telling people I have my own place, you know, with my uh, cool roommate, Simon. Uh, <laughs> uh, but emotionally, I'm still attached to her. And so she's going to rebuke me in a second, I promise you. Lately, I've been caught up with this idea, like, my mother, one day, I'm just going to say it, my mommy's not going to be here. She's like, Señor te reprenda, I'm going to live forever in Jesus' name. And so I've been trying to come up with these, these ways to, to have memories for my, with my mom that I can look back on one day when, like, like forever, forever, for, like, years, 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 years from now, I'm gonna, she's going to have, like, 18 great, 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 great grandchildren before. Um... So one of these things that I do is I, uh, I go into her room throughout the day, maybe before work, and I, I lay with her, I lay in her bed, and I tell her to tell me a story. We hang out, we talk about life. Um, <clears throat> she complains about how heavy I am. And uh, <clears throat> one of these things that, that we were talking about recently, which is weird, like it's news that it's, like I'm surprised that it's new to me because it was about uh, my father and when I was born, and I know every detail about when I was born, like, like that uh, uh, I was, uh, my mom calls me the, the uh, baby Jesus because she doesn't know where I came from. She's like, me and your father were not on good terms, if you know what I mean. Uh, so she's like, I don't know how you came out. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and so I know everything. Like she has a, I've, I had a video on my birthday. I recorded her telling me like where she was in her apartment in Brooklyn, when her water broke, all these details. Yeah, I know. I got issues. I'm a mama's boy, remember. Um, so one of these stories that she told me is that apparently my father wanted me to be a girl. <clears throat> like apparently three boys, he was tired of them. He was fed up. He wanted a girl finally. And, and this is the thing about my father, he's Cuban, and he's intense, so he doesn't just want a girl, he didn't just want a girl, he demanded a girl. He was like, God, I want my girl. I'm going to do my best Spanish. Yo soy, yo sé que yo, yo voy a tener un hija. He was like, God, I want my girl. It's my girl, and I want it now. Like, I want a daughter. This guy was adamant about having a daughter. They went to the hospital. Well, I guess I was there, right? I was in her stomach. We went to the hospital, and they get the sonogram. And here's the thing about sonograms. They don't mess up boys being boys. Like, they might say it's going to be a girl, and then, like, nine months later, ooh, it comes out a boy. But, but when it's a boy for anatomical reasons, like, they know that they know it's a boy. Like, they don't really mess that up. But my father, at least in my imagination, he, he turns into the rock and he's like, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. W what did you say the, 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 the baby was going to be? It doesn't matter what you said the baby was going to be. I'm having a girl. I know I'm going to have a girl. 
pure denial. For nine months, this guy proclaimed, God, turn it into a girl, God. I want a girl, God. He had his entire church, like, gang up on my mother, surround her, put their hands on her belly. And listen, I'm all for corporate prayer. June 27th, uh, let's pray together. Amen. There's something a little creepy about the way these guys did it. They start laying their hands, and they're like, God, make it a girl, God. My father's like, you have the power to turn it into a girl. Which, hearing this, I feel a little violated. Like, bro, you couldn't just pray that the doctor's wrong. You're telling, like, God to turn me into this. I feel uncomfortable. Like, I, I don't watch the notebook anymore because I feel self-conscious. So for nine months, this would happen. And, and what I love about the story, you guys know the end of the story. Hello, boy, <laughs> man. <laughs> but... My name is Reuben, which has nothing to do with sandwiches. Stop saying that. Um, but in Hebrew, it actually means behold a son, which in today's day and age is like, it's a boy. And I'm a petty person, so I love that. Like, the thing that you wanted to be a girl is named, it's a boy. It's, not only did you have a son, he has to call me, hey, it's a son, come here. <laughs> hey, look, it's a son. What's going on? It's a son. How's it going? It's a boy. Like, like I, I'm just, I'm petty, so I love that idea. But what's so interesting about the story, what captures me about the story, and the reason why I tell it to you today, the newcomer, the new people today are like, I thought we came to church. What is this? Um, is because I think it captures humanity so perfectly. Here he is. Rather than, listen, I'm all for prayer. Rather than inviting God's will and saying, God, like, I, I think I want a daughter. Like, this is on my heart. Like, like trying to invite God's will he tries to impose his will. I'm like, man, that's, that's, that's humanity, man. See, here's the thing. The Pharisees were human too. And just like my father was waiting for a child but didn't expect the son, the Pharisees were waiting for a Messiah, but they did not expect Jesus. Jesus did not fit the mold that they created for a Messiah. And so every time Jesus, when we look in Scripture, every time Jesus does something, the Pharisees have questions, and they try to justify it. And so actually, right before we get into this conversation, chapter 9 kind of leads right into it. And in 9, Jesus heals this blind guy, and, and they, they interrogate the blind man. You ever know somebody like that? How'd you get healed? But what happened? And they're trying to justify Jesus. They're like, nah, he must be a sorcerer. He ain't the real deal. And it eventually culminates into this conversation. And we pick up in chapter 10. And Jesus starts talking about this, this weird stuff. He's like, hey, look, all the people that came before me are thieves and robbers. To get into the sheep pen, you have to, but you have to enter through the gate. And, and what, it, what it becomes clear is he's outlining something. He's saying, Hey, look, the false prophets, they were false prophets. The people that have come before me, those are thieves and robbers. Here's how you know who's legit. They come through the gate. If they enter through the gate, they're legit. They're the good shepherd. And stay tuned. We're in a series. Next week, we're going to be talking about Jesus' claim for being the good shepherd and what that means. That's a beautiful thing, Jesus being the shepherd for our lives. And when I hear him say the good shepherd goes through the gate, I'm expecting him to, like, they're, they're trying to figure out where he got his cosign from. Like, yo, bro, how you doing miracles? Like, so I'm expecting him to be like, <laughs> this is how I entered through the gate. You, you know all those prophecies you heard about? I've fulfilled them. Like, you know the virgin birth? I actually, that was, I, I was born of a virgin birth. You, did you know that when I got baptized, uh, <laughs> God came down. He was like, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended, that's my dove pose, descended like a dove. Did you know? Like, I'm expecting this, but he doesn't say that. They get confused, and, and, and in verse 1, he lays it out, right? And in verse 7, he says this, very truly, I tell you, I'm the gate. Like, like the gate is what solidifies people. The gate is the cosign, and you're looking for my cosigner, but what you don't realize is that I'm the cosign. You're looking for who gives me this authority. You don't understand that I am the author authority. You don't understand that. You're looking for where I got my seal of approval. I am the seal of approval. And when we understand this, what I want to talk about, and as a matter of fact, my first point is that Jesus is our authority. 
put easier to remember. Jesus doesn't need to be authenticated. He is the authenticator. And I think that's so important for us to understand with Jesus as the gate to our lives. Because when we understand that Jesus, see, it's not just about saying yes to, yes to God, church. It's about letting Jesus be our yes and our no. That whatever life tries to send through us, that we allow Jesus to be the validator. And if life tries to say that you are a failure, Jesus as your gate will go, no, 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 my word doesn't co-sign that because my word says that you are more than a conqueror. Do we have a people who believe they are more than conquerors today? Say it to somebody. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. Jesus is my co-sign. When we understand that Jesus is our authority, we stop, see, because we, we have good intentions, right? We all have good intentions. We're, we're all good people. We, we try to be, at least. When we understand that Jesus is our authority, though, we stop trying to be good, and we allow him to tell us what is good. We, we surrender to the one who knows best, and therefore we get the very best of life. Some, can, can I be honest? Can I let you guys in on a little secret? I'm being transparent today. <sighs> some of the worst mistakes I've ever made, some of the stupidest decisions, like just the worst decisions, like why did I do that, have been with the best of intentions. I thought I knew what was good. Some of the, 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 the oh, why did I do that? Why did I do that moments? But when we place our trust in the authority, when we let Jesus be the yes and the no to our lives, we don't have to worry. See, we operate with Jesus as, a, as an authenticator, and so our lives kind of become different. And things that try to get in, when, when they're not co-signed by him, they stay out because that's what a gate does. It opens and it closes, right? So he's going to open for the things that he approves of, but he's going to keep closed the things that have no place in your life. See, see, because what happens is, is oftentimes we're, we think we're doing good, but we, what we end up doing is we take the word of God and we filter it through the will of man when we should be filtering the will of man through the word of God. See, Abraham was, was promised a kid, but Abraham, rather than allowing his situation to be filtered through what God had promised him, he, he took God's promise, and, and he goes, no, 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 but, bro, I'm old. And, like, Abraham was old, old. Like, he was old, old. He's like, I can't have a kid. His, his wife laughed at the idea. She's like, bro, I'm not, I'm not just old. I'm barren. There's, there's no way. Because, see, what she did was she took her circumstance, and she filtered it. She, she took her, God's promise and filtered it. Through, through her circumstance. But church, when we take our circumstances and when we look at what is around us and we say, no, 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 God is my authority, not my situation. I'm going to take my situation and I'm going to filter it with, through what God has promised me. Oh, church. Our lives are different. See, what I love about Jesus' claim to authority is he doesn't just say, hey, I'm your authority. In the same sentence, in the same breath, he, he provides the implication. See, in verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. See, when I'm your authority, you have salvation, and they will come in and go out and find pasture. See, when Jesus is your authority, my second point is this, is that Jesus is our salvation and provision, a.k.a. when Jesus leads, we succeed. I can keep going. When Jesus is our door, we have access to more. When Jesus is our way, we can seize the day. Hashtag sermon bars. <laughs> but, but, but it's the truth. When Jesus is our authority, when we enter through the gate, we have salvation. Can I, can I, can I break down a misconception to us today, guys? And this is, this is, this is as much as a message it is for me. This is my own, this comes through my own revelation. See, I thought that sin was a battle. Like, Jesus saved you, so you gotta, you gotta battle sin. You gotta, this is, you gotta use this as a sword. But, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is that Jesus came and defeated sin. You know how you avoid temptation? You know how you avoid sin? You lean into Jesus. You enter through the gate. See, Romans 6, 6 says that, For we know our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin. If somebody set me free and I was a slave, and the person who used to be my master tried to enslave me. Temptation comes and sin comes and tries to bring me back. I'm not going to fight the master. I'm going to go to the person that set me free and be like, hey, handle this. See, the times that I've battled temptation and I've battled sin and I thought I was being a good Christian. Oh, I'm not going to do it this time. Oh, no, no. is the times I've fallen the hardest. But the times that I've just owned up to my own weakness and my own incapabilities as a human being and said, God, I, I don't got this. God, in my weakness, God, in my weakness, you, I need your strength, Lord. You come into my life. Did you know that grace is your greatest tool? I, I thought that the, the scripture says the, the righteous man falls seven times but get back up all seven and I thought that grace is what picked you up but not only is grace what enables you to get back up but it's the very thing that keeps you from falling in the first place when grace enters your life when you lean into grace it props you up rather than trying to take a stance rather than trying to battle sin you surrender to Jesus and you lean into his grace and you lean into his mercy and you enter through the gate and that is where you find your salvation. See, the Bible is an entire story of humanity trying to get it together and they get close, they get close and they drop the ball. We see the nation of Israel just mess up time after time. God sets them free from Egypt and, and a trip that should have taken two, two weeks or two months ends up taking 40 years. Because they just keep, they just can't get it together. But God, our faithful God, since, since Adam and Eve, keeps promising something. He keeps saying, hey, I got you. Somebody's going to come, and he's going to fight this battle that you can't win. And can I let you know that, that the, the Pharisees were waiting for a Messiah. The, the, the people of Israel were waiting for a Messiah. But we live in a time after the Messiah. We live in a time where Jesus has already defeated it all. And all we have to do is enter through the gate. His salvation is right there. Turn to someone say, enter through the gate. I I'm entering through the gate. Can we give God a shout of praise for doing the best, for, for living the life, for living the life that we could not live, dying the death that we deserved, and then resurrecting and destroying sin. But see, he doesn't leave it at salvation. He, he, he promises pasture, and there's something. <clears throat> Have you ever met those kids? Like the little kids. I can't say how I feel about those kids because I work with kids. But, you know, the kids that, like, they come into your house and, and uh, they touch something and you're like, no, don't touch them. They're like, but my dad said I could. You're like, no, 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 don't do that. But my dad said I could. No, no, you can't have that. Oh, uh, my dad said I could. Those kids. You ever met those kids? It's annoying. But, but there's something profound about a child who knows what their father said they could. And see, when you live your life by the yeses and noes of Jesus, when you understand that Jesus is the authority in your life and you enter through the gate and God has said yes to you, you can walk around and say, no, my dad said I could. See, I know I, know I look like I've been set back, but I know that God has said that I could. I, I'm not worried because my dad said I could. Can you, is there anybody who is glad that their father said that they could? There is a prom. I promise you, there is a, you're not just created for nothing. There is a purpose on your life. And when you are walking in the purpose and you are walking in the yes of Jesus, you walk knowing that your dad said that you could. It's all pasture. You're, you're walking into pasture. I love you, Danny. Whew. You're walking through pasture. And, and what I love is that it's not just a prosperity message. It's not like, oh, when you follow Jesus, you get a million dollars. No, the truth of the matter is that, that gold is pennies compared to purpose. And, and when you follow Jesus, your pasture is a little bit more defined. And what I love about this scene is that Jesus does not just promise pasture. He kind of goes on to define his purpose and why he's here and what life in him looks like. See, he says the thief comes to steal and destroy. Those, those people that have come before me, they're frauds. They've come to steal and destroy. But me, I've come to give life and life to the full. A full life. My second point is this, that Jesus is our fulfillment. 
See, with, without Jesus, can I, be, can I be straight up with you guys? Can I be blunt? blunt? Without Jesus, it's, it's possible to have a great life. We see it. We, we've watched Keeping Up with the Kardashians. But only through Jesus can we have a complete life. See, Colossians 2, chapter, verse 9 through 10 says, For in Christ lives the fullness of God, so you also are complete through your union with Christ. See, it does not matter how much we have, church. It matters where we are. It, I, I don't care about how much I have. I don't care if, if I'm in debt or, or but if, if I'm walking in my purpose. If I have a million or if I have two dollars, I'm walking in my purpose. And it is something about Jesus that brings fulfillment. Jesus comes to offer you a life that is full. See, when we enter through a gate, through the gate, and we give our life to the one that's faithful, Jesus is faithful to us. We, we can live a life that is faith-filled. We live a life knowing we are fulfilled in Christ. Knowing that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going on around us, our situation, our circumstance, where we, whether we have a little, where we have a lot, because we have enough in Christ. We have our fulfillment in Christ. They say, I'm entering through the gate. I'm not looking back. See, because when you look back outside the gate, there's life too. Jesus doesn't just say, I've come to give life because life is there. We all have life. We all know what life is. Jesus sets a a, a, a distinction. He says, I've given life to the full. You know what exists out the gate? Burdens and drama and pain and also happiness and joy. You'll find someone, you know. You know what exists inside the gate? Burdens and trials. James, the book of James says, consider it joy when trials come your way and life and happiness. But you know what's inside the gate that's not outside the gate? Completeness. Fulfillment. The outside the gate is life. And inside the gate is life, but it's life to the full. See, the truth of the matter is, is that without Jesus, you can find meaning. We see people who find meaning. You can find things that give you meaning. You can find meaning in, in your work. You can find meaning in your relationship. You can find meaning in your children. <sighs> there are words that have meanings, right? But that's not their definition. See, when you enter through the gate, you don't find meaning. You find your definition. You find your very purpose. Jesus says, oh, Sheila, I know life has said you mean this. I know people have come around and said, oh, no, Sheila means this. But no, no, I've defined you as this. Victoria, I know life has tried to tell you you mean this. But no, 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 no. You have been defined for a work. Orlando, you, you, you found meaning and certain things, but it does not define you. Jesus defines us. It is in him that we are made complete. And when you live in this fulfillment, there's this peace. See, I'm a college guy, right? So, so my, my philosophy professor told me one time that you, you know why people seek money is because it provides an end to a mean. If, if all your needs were taken care of, why would you go to work? I'm, I'm not going to work. I love my job, but why? And when you live a life that is fulfilled, see, if I offered you peace, not money, not, not, not the, the, the dream life, the big mansion with the house and the kids, not the best career, but I just offered you a peaceful life that no matter what comes your way, would you not take the peace? And when we are fulfilled, no matter where we are in life, there is a peace that enters our heart. In verse 8, before he even gets into any of this, he says that all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. When you're at peace, it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what the voices around you say. It doesn't matter what life sends your way. You have peace. You have Jesus. Why, why, why would you? Turn to someone and say, I got my peace. Not like I got my peace, like I have my peace. I don't want anybody saying, Kuhau said I have a peace. No. Uh, <laughs> 
There is a peace that comes over us. My, my fourth point and my last point for today is that Jesus is our peace, a.k.a. Christ brings clarity. He says, the sheep have not listened to their voice. As my mom has so many times told me, there is a difference between hearing and listening. You're going to hear the voices. You're going to see the drama. But you're not going to listen to it. Because you have your peace. You have your eyes focused on the gate. Once you've entered through the gate and you fix your eyes on Jesus, there may be a storm around you. But in the eye of the storm, you are calm because at the center of your life is Jesus. We spoke about Jesus being the light of the world in John 8, 12. He says, Jesus spoke to his people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have a, life that lead, a light that leads to life. Darkness is not of us. Like darkness is not something we have to walk in once we've entered through the gate that is Jesus Christ. Darkness it's darkness is the absence of light, and if we're clinging on to the light of the world, how could we be worried about the darkness that's elsewhere? Jesus is our peace. We, we can filter the noise through him. When we surrender to his authority, it's, it's not just to say, oh, oh, God, you're the boss. You're... No, 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 it, it's because he knows best, and in him there is fulfillment. In him there is purpose. In him there is salvation and provision and there is peace. I love the way the author of Hebrews describes Jesus. What, what it looks like to fix your eyes on Jesus. See, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. When you have your eyes on Jesus, you live a life that is weightless. You're able to strip off the sin that so easily entangles you. You're able to strip off the weight that you, you, you felt burdened about. Because you have your eyes on Jesus. When you've entered through the gate, there is a weightlessness that is about, that just, just there's an air about you. People look at you and you walk different. Because your peace is not placed in, in your possessions. Your peace is placed in the one who possesses you, your, your, your creator. What I love about verse 1 is that he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, to the life of faith. And the worship team can come up. See, the chapter before, he kind of outlines this. He, he, he's saying in, in verse 12, he says, we're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses. And, and, and I, I don't have time to go into every detail. I'm, I'm actually closing. And when I say that, I mean it, I promise. <laughs> but... When we look at chapter 11, I've taken some highlights. I've just taken some snippets of chapter 11, the, the chapter before this. And, and we're going to pick up from verse 7. He says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance, it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though it were dry ground. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms and ruled with justice and received what God had promised him. But what I love is he doesn't stop there. He gives the balance, the perfectly balanced view of a Christian life. He says these people overthrew kingdoms, but others, everybody say that with me, but others, but others were tortured refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. No, no, no. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at 
and their backs were cut open with whips. Some died by stoning, some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. He goes on for a little bit, and then we get to chapter 12, and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses who have entered through the gate and despite what storm they came through, despite what oppression they came through, whether they overthrew kingdoms or they were being and mistreated, they they kept their eyes on Jesus. So therefore, since we've seen it done, since we live in a time where Jesus has already come, since we've seen it done, Let's strip off the weight. Let's live a life that is weightless. Let's just enter through the gate and come what may. I know that my provision is in Jesus. My authority is is found in Jesus. I live by his yes and his no. And through that, I find his provision. I find fulfillment. It does not matter what life may try to throw at me. Because as long as I cling to Jesus, I have the true life. I have a full life. If I'm through the gate, I will come in and I will go out and it is all pasture. Can we stand on our feet today, church?